another episode of Raising Monarchs. Occasionally, in this Raising Monarchs series, we have something difficult to talk about. This is one of those times. You took in a monarch egg. It hatched. You raised that caterpillar throughout all the stages. Everything was going well. It made a chrysalis. When the adult came out of that chrysalis, for whatever reason, it was unable to fly. This can happen for a number of reasons. In our most recent episode, we were talking about problems with the chrysalis and how you shouldn't give up. Sometimes, even if a chrysalis looks bad, a healthy adult flying monarch can still come out of it. Gotta give it that chance. But of course, that success story doesn't always happen. Sometimes a monarch can come out of a chrysalis that looked fine even, but the monarch has maybe a deformity in its wings. If the chrysalis fell because it wasn't securely attached and it dried with some flatness to one side of it, Sometimes a very healthy monarch can come out of that. Other times, one set of the wings might be a bit smaller than the others, or just misshapen in some way. Problems with the adult developing inside can occur. In other cases, it can be too that when the monarch came out of the chrysalis, it was perfectly fine. But as it started to pump its wings full of fluid, something happened. Somehow, maybe it fell, it wasn't able to properly pump fluid into those wings, and that's a very delicate time for the monarch. If it can't successfully pump fluid into the wings and let them dry properly, those wings could be damaged or misshapen, preventing it from ever being able to fly. Most recently, I've had a couple of monarchs emerge with problems with their wings. In one case, it was a chrysalis that had fallen sometime overnight, and it had fallen before it had fully dried and hardened. It did have some flatness to one side, and when the butterfly emerged, that monarch has one set of its wings, very, very small, and it is not able to fly. Coincidentally, I had another chrysalis that had darkened at a different time than they usually do. Sometime overnight, in the dark hours of 2, 3, 4 a.m., somewhere in there, it eclosed. It emerged from the chrysalis. And when it was trying to pump fluid into the wings, it must have fallen somehow. When I got up for my morning jog at 6.30 a.m., I came out to find this butterfly laying on the tarp I set out, and its wings were folded and crumpled. When we have these situations occur, where we've raised an adult and it's not able to fly, what do you do? And some of you have been asking questions about this and it's something very valid to ask about. So I wanted to discuss and explore some options with you. Before I get into it though, I need to make some things very clear. This isn't a fun situation. None of these options are really that great. I've got three options that I wanna discuss with you. And of those three options, because of the number of people who often watch these videos, I know, going into this, there's going to be some of you who very much dislike one or two, or maybe all three of the options. I understand that. It's just not a good situation to be in anyway. But the reason I've chosen these three to discuss is because they all have some grounding in logic. So as you watch the rest of this video, please keep the following in mind. First, I am not advocating for one of these options above the others. I'm just trying to let you see and discuss and think about what the options are. Next, I don't think that these three are the only three that are out there. They are the three that I know about, and they are three that I would say do have a line of logic to them. In the end, I would say any of these three are ones that you should put thought into and decide what you are comfortable with and what you would choose to do. It's important to think about this stuff ahead of time because if you're willing to take in monarch eggs and raise monarchs, you might encounter one of these situations at some point. And it's better to know what you would choose to do when that happens than to be stuck saying, I haven't ever thought about this. I don't know what to do. If you are watching this and you think you have a better option than any of these three, or maybe just an alternative other option I haven't brought up, I'd love for you to talk about it in the comments below. Discuss the logic behind your option, why you think that it's something that should be considered. I really feel like we are a community that learns from each other. Okay, now with that stuff firmly in mind, let's talk about these options. And let's start off on a good foot. This first option is probably the one that nobody's going to really ever hate, because it is the most compassionate one. One option is to simply continue caring for the monarch. As I raise monarchs, it's always constantly in my mind that these are not, to me, pets. These are wild animals. I think it's important to have that difference. In a case, though, where we know the monarch isn't going to make it out there in nature, then I think it's perfectly acceptable to decide that you want to continue caring for the monarch as if it was a pet. But this would mean a few things. 
you need to have some place to keep it, some enclosure for it. Also, you need to feed it. You gotta provide for it food and energy. I have a video on how to feed adults using a honey water solution. That link is in the description below. And so it certainly is doable, but it's also going to be a time commitment. In nature, monarchs are flying often and feeding often. Now, if yours isn't flying, it doesn't need as much of that energy, but still, it does need to be fed a good amount and periodically throughout the day. If you're already raising monarchs and you have a job, then this is already putting some strain on your amount of free time. Do you have on top of that the amount of time it would take to also care for a pet monarch? Other than the added time commitment that this is going to require and the cost of supplies, are there really any downsides to this? Is there a counter argument to it? At first it might seem like there isn't, but there actually is. And I know that what I'm about to say, some of you aren't going to like, but I'm just trying to make sure that the information's out there for people to consider. Here goes. When it comes to insects, they actually have some just pretty limited amount of instinct that they operate on. For butterflies, usually those impulses are pretty much, I need food, I want to find a mate. For males especially, I'm going to claim, protect, and maintain this territory. The urge to lay eggs for females. And another big one is, I want to fly away. If you keep a monarch as a pet, it is constantly going to have that urge and desire to be free. And it won't ever be. So keeping it in a cage, an enclosure, for a long period of time, even if you're feeding it and taking care of it, you also have a pet monarch that wants to constantly be out there and be doing something else. And it will never really get to feel that satisfaction of being free. For some people, that's enough of a reason why they don't like this option. Option number two. You could still release this monarch out into nature. Find some nice flowers in the area, maybe even in your own yard, place it on one, and let nature take its course. I know a lot of you don't like that I just said that, but please hear me out. This does have some logic to it. For starters, when we set out to raise monarchs, the idea is these are things that are out in nature, we're going to collect the egg and take it in, removing it from nature. We're doing that to up the chances of it becoming an adult. We put in our time and effort to feeding it and caring for it, and then once it emerges as an adult, the plan always was to then release it. This would be then us not deviating from that original plan that we decided to do. And keep in mind, it was quite possible that if this was a deformity in the wings, or if this was due to the animal falling while it was pumping fluid into its wings, well, those two things could happen in nature just fine. When it comes to monarchs and their coloration, that orange and black, and also the black and yellow stripes that they have as a caterpillar, are warning signals to predators that I taste nasty. That nasty taste doesn't really work with reptiles, amphibians, and other insects, but with birds and mammals, they taste pretty foul. The thing is, though, there's a misconception here. And it's one that I even had, too, until I learned a lot more. You hear that the monarch is poisonous to birds, and so they are going to try to avoid eating it. The thing is, some species of birds, they do have that instinct to just stay away no matter what anyway. But for a lot of species of birds. Entomologists who study monarchs and ornithologists who study birds both agree that for a lot of species, this is actually a learned behavior to avoid them. Plenty of species of birds don't just come out of the egg knowing to not bother to eat a monarch. Instead, it takes one, or two, or three, or four, before they start to get the idea, this is an animal that if I try to eat it, it's just going to be something I want to spit out anyway, and it's not worth the time and effort. And so having a monarch that can't fly out there in nature, well, that does make it easy prey for a bird to be able to find it, and eat it, and learn from its mistake. So in that way, it does still have a chance to benefit the population that you're trying to help. Think about it this way. Let's say you put this monarch out onto some flowers in your yard, and a robin or a cardinal or a blue jay comes by and sees it and decides, I'm going to eat that guy. It does its best, but it then quickly spits it out because of the very foul taste. That bird just got some quick education on why it should avoid the black and orange coloration. So maybe next time it sees a different monarch, it already has learned that, and it doesn't bother harming that one. If you had never released your flightless monarch out into nature, well then that bird misses out on that education, and it still needs to learn. And so the next time it does see a monarch butterfly flying around, 
it might decide to go after that one and harm and kill that one. So truly, of the three options, while this one might seem harsh and cruel, this is actually the only one of the three that still can benefit this population that we're trying to save. And in a sense, too, that monarch does get to experience nature. It gets to experience the sensations of it, the smells and sights of nature, the feeling of the wind and the breeze. I do think that there is some poetic romanticism to this option. All right, option number three. This is one that a lot of people aren't going to like, but some would argue it is the most humane thing to do. The third option is to euthanize the monarch butterfly. In the next video that comes out, I'm going to be showing how one goes about doing this with what is an envelope freezer method. And I promise no monarchs will actually be harmed in the making of that video. But some might say, well, the first option, maybe I don't have the time commitment for that, and also, I don't like the idea of a monarch in captivity constantly feeling like it needs to get away. But option two doesn't work for them either because they don't have the heart to say, well, I'm going to let you go out there and either be eaten by a predator or unfortunately starve to death. Nature can be cruel, and putting the monarch in a freezer is seen as a more humane way to end its life. I know, I, I don't even like talking about it anyway. I really don't. But still, it's something to be discussed. Okay, those are the three options. Kind of been a rough ride, this video, huh? I think discussion on this topic is a healthy thing to have. Go ahead and talk about these options. Let's learn from each other. And I gotta say this again. I'm not promoting one option over the other as being the better of the three. I respect all of these options because I see the logic behind each one of them. Thank you for checking out this video. And, and I hope you understand that yeah, this is a sensitive topic. And if you didn't like some of these options I mentioned, well, understand, I don't really like them either, but I think it's because I don't really like the situation that makes you have to think about which one you want to do. And while I don't like any of them, I don't dislike them either because I see the logic behind each one. And I do want to point out, I could have just chose to not make this video. I could decide to take the easy route and just never even discuss this topic. The thing is, though, that's just never really been who I am. I don't really opt for the easier path. So if some harshness comes my way for this, I think it's kind of juvenile, and I guess I'm comfortable with that. I'm Rich Lund, and I'm here wishing you luck that you don't have to encounter this type of situation. Catch you next time.